648 regist uh, registered uh, participants attend this, but let's see how many join. And uh, I, I wish you a great event, okay? Uh, we have the, the WhatsApp chat, just in case uh, we did anything. And um, during the panel session, you can turn your camera in all the time, or if you wish, maybe just turn it off and then turn, in, turn on when you are going to speak. It's open, it's no formal thing on this, okay? Um, all right. Thank you. See you later. See you on bueno, the other side. Solo mencionarle a María Fernanda que uh -huh. tenga cuidado de cuando ya hablen en inglés tiene que seleccionar el canal de inglés. Sí. So uh, the last one last thing and Shane and Shane that you you join a little bit later. Just make sure to speak uh, not so fast for the interpretation to work. That's right. You know it. You know the the the, the drill song. Yeah. Yeah. We'll try to make sure I do that. Can Thanks you hear me in English, people? Tim, can you hear me in English? Okay, thank you, Paul. This is just because Spanish is 30% wordier than English. So if you run, I won't be able to catch up with you. So should we just stop every now and again and let you catch up? <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, just make a break in, in our speaking so you, you catch up, okay. Okay, I will switch interpretation button to Spanish now. Buenos días a todos los participantes. Eh, estamos empezando esta sesión en unos minutos. Gracias. Hello to all the participants. We'll start the session in a few minutes. A los que se están conectando, buenos días, buenas tardes ante todo. Vamos For those who are connecting, good morning. We'll start in a few minutes. Please take into consideration the simultaneous interpretation button since this event will be carried out in English and Spanish. You have to uh, choose the language you need in the interpretation buttons that you have in your screen.
Ok, muy buenos días a todos los participantes. Hello, good morning to all the participants. My name is Flavio Salvatierra. I'm the regional head of the set office of ICAO. We are going to start this web seminar together with Kienzo and North America, Central America and Caribbean area of ACAO. And also we have the support from the International Council, Airport International Council. I will start by giving some instructions regarding the event. First of all, the event is being recorded in both languages. So please be aware that the event will be shared later through the links that we are going to present. The presentation is in English, but I will be speaking in Spanish now. We will have a one hour and 15 minute panel, but regard, um, Due to questions and answer, maybe we'll take a little longer. The interpretation item uh, that you see here, please select that one. And then select the language of your choice because some of the presentations will be in Spanish and some others in English. As I said before, the recording will be available in a link that we are going to make available later. Also, be informed that the chat icon is enabled and it's used a lot, but when we start, the charge is going to be disabled and we will only have the Q&A button available for you. And we would like you to include your questions there. Some of them will be answered immediately and depending on the time some others will be sent to the panel if you have the same question please just give a like to the same questions so questions with more likes will be probably uh, will or will have more possibility to be posed. We have coordinated with the panelists to answer and to review all these questions later, later in case we don't have enough time. Also, at the end of the session, you will have an option to pose other questions. Finally, in uh, the mail, in cars have 21 you will be able to send the questions as i told you at the end you will receive a survey when the webinar is closed you will receive a pop-up window of the explorer in your device and you will be able to make some comments. The agenda is very simple. We have an opening that is exactly the one that I am using. In, the se in second place, we'll have a panel moderated by Shane Campbell from Canso regarding challenges implementation of the GRF. That is the global reporting format focused or on ANSPs. Also in the panel, we'll see that we have some guests from different areas so that we can have a proper interaction. And finally, if we have the time, we can have a Q&A session. 
these are the international organizations that have supported this event and i would like to thank you thank you for your confidence for your trust for the support to this event especially our kinso colleagues that helped us organize this event the panelists are the people that are here on the screen during the panel they will introduce themselves so i won't take time to do it right now here there are some interest links this presentation will be available in the event web page that can be accessed through the www.akao.int slash SAM and go to the meeting tab, you will be able to find this event where you will find all the information. You have here another link. So where you will be finding this presentation and the recording of the same. Con eso damos las las primeras instrucciones para el evento. So these are the first um, instructions for the event. If you want to raise your hand, this option is not able because uh, due to uh, band with we will not have that able but we will have the q a button so we encourage you to use it i would like to ask jaime calderon regional head of air drums and ground aids of north america central america and caribbean region to uh, give us some words thank you fabio Good morning to you all and welcome to this event. We would like to tell you that this is part of a series of events that we have put together starting two years ago and also independently in the CAR and SAM sessions to assist states in the implementation of the GRF. I would like to tell you that regarding car region, we haven't received answers from the member states regarding the implementation plan of the GRF. So I take advantage of this um, intervention to ask the West East Caribbean session and the Central American session to send a our your implementation plan of the GRF to follow up on it and also to continue with our support to you in the implementation. I hope that this event is very useful and helpful for you, especially for uh, navigation service providers. I really wish this is helpful. I wish you luck and I give you the floor again to you, Flavio. Thank you very much, Jaime, for your words. And I support your words. Both regional areas are starting an implementation plan supporting the states and uh, with focal points very specific focal points we have some we have had some challenges to come forward please get in contact with your air authorities to overcome all these challenges not also in latin america but in all uh, the different offices in the world. I would like to ask Maria Elena Sandoval to give us some words before starting. Maria Elena, please, I will give you the word. Please press the simultaneous interpretation button in Spanish. 
Good morning to you all. First of all, we would like to thank the different uh, regions, North America and Central America, to be part of this important initiative. In ACA, we have developed different paths in different languages, prepared courses, and of course, we have developed a promotion campaign of the GRF format. We would like to tell you that your authorities have not started with implementation of GRF. We would like to support you in order to start uh, with this, um, with your asking your authorities to support in this regard. Thank you, Maria Elena, for your words. At this moment, I will ask Shane Campbell to start moderating our panel. Shane, thank you very much. And thank you, Kenzo, for your help in this event. Uh, the floor is yours, Shane. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fabio. So greetings, everyone. Um, and, and thanks to ICAO for inviting me to participate in this event. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Shane Campbell, and I am the uh, safety program manager for CANSO. And as Fabio mentioned, I'll be your moderator today for this very important global safety initiative on the global reporting format. We have lined up a panel of experts that will give various perspectives on GRF, and I think you're going to be pleased with what they have to say. I would venture a guess that most of you who are participating today have heard of GRF. As you may know, this has been an up and coming ICAO safety initiative for quite a few years now. And for those of you who have been tracking it, you will know it was originally scheduled for, uh, for implementation or applicability on November 2020. However, with COVID and the difficulty surrounding it to the aviation community, the decision was taken to extend the applicability date to this November, uh, November 4th. So the real reason for this webinar is to give you, the audience, a chance to hear from our panel of experts and to ask questions on specific items related to the GRF, whether it be pre-implementation questions, implementation questions, or even post-implementation questions. To help with this, we have assembled five experts, one from IKO headquarters in Montreal, one from airports, one from ATC, one from AIS, and one from an ANSP, who also happens to have an AIS background. And I would also mention that our IKO headquarters uh, representative has an ATC background. So. I believe this provides a very well-rounded look at GRF from multiple angles. And so I encourage you to ask, or for you to take advantage of the opportunity to ask them questions on items that are important to you. As Fabio mentioned, we have the Q&A function. I will be monitoring the Q&A function in real time. And we have uh, um, several people looking for questions coming in. So. You don't have to wait until the speaker has finished to put your questions in, and we will be monitoring it uh, in, in real time. So we have a very condensed schedule, and so the format is going to be a bit different than what you would normally see in a webinar like this. Basically, each speaker will have a few minutes to discuss their point of view, and afterwards, I may ask a follow-up question. Once all the speakers have provided their information, we will come together in a panel discussion while I will start to provide audience questions to the panelists. I can't stress enough how important it is for you to participate. And so I encourage you to start asking questions now so that we have them ready to go when the time comes. So let's get started with our first speaker who happens to be from ICAO. Paul Adamson is currently an airport operations and inter interoperability officer for the Air Navigation Bureau of ICAO. Paul has a background as an ATCO with experience in the UK, Middle East, and Europe. 
More recently, he has been engaged with the development and implementation activities focused on capacity and safety improvements for airports. He works for the Pan-European Air Traffic Control Organization, known as Eurocontrol, and is currently detached to ICAO in Montreal, where he's the focal point for runway safety and for the GRF. And with that, Paul, you have the floor. If you could please turn on your camera. I see that you're off mute. We're just waiting for your camera to come on, Paul. Okay, there you are. Okay. Great. Thank you, Shane. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you, Fabio, for the, the um, invitation to speak at this important event about a very important topic. Um, the applicability date is almost upon us now, um, having been delayed by one year. The 4th of November 2021 is nearly upon us. And that's a really important date and it's a really important topic. Um, the global reporting format, the GRF, is dealing with runway safety. Uh, and as we all know, runway safety remains one of the uh, high risk categories, one of the priorities for ICAO. Indeed, runway excursions, I think, remain the most common form of accidents that we have in aviation today. And if I think I'm correct, last year, two of the eight fatal accidents in aviation were related to, to runway excursions. So it's a really important topic from that perspective. It's a really important topic as well, I think, as we emerge from the current crisis. We talk often about the need to rebuild confidence in aviation. And I think uh, ensuring that the runways that we operate from are safe and taking all the steps we can to make sure they're safe is a really important step in, in rebuilding or maintaining that confidence. And also another really important part is the fact that this development has been going on since 2008. Uh, that's when the work on the GRF first started in response to a number of uh, serious runway excursions and recognition of the need to improve the reporting and acting upon runway surface conditions. So the development work started in ICAO in about 2008. It ran through till 2016, where we went through the process with the ICAO Council, uh, the Air Navigation Commission. We had state letters and such like. And going through that process, I think it's fair to say that we all agreed on the GRF. So it's been agreed upon. It's been incorporated into the ICAO annexes, incidentally, as a shall. So it's something that we need to do, let's put it, put it like that, it's something that we need to, to get on with. However, recognising the importance of the topic, I think ICAO has quite rightly not just left states and industry to, to get on with it. We've been providing support. Um, we started that uh, work in providing support back in 2019 when we hosted a global symposium on the global reporting format, which was very well attended for such an event in, in Montreal. In those days, of course, we were meeting face to face, which was very nice. Uh, after 2019, we continued that um, kind of um, action and we ran about 10 face to face seminars around the world um, in the different regions, including in, in, in the uh, uh, South South American region. And they were very successful. We helped build awareness of the GRF amongst the community. And then in 2020, uh, we had the crisis, of course. We had the very important action by ICAO, and it's quite unique that, that they postponed the applicability date by one year from 2020 to 2021, recognizing the challenges of aviation and also recognizing, I think, the importance of the topic and the need to implement it correctly. So that happened. We then switched to um, a webinar type format, and we've run about 20 or so webinars around the world. Uh, over the last uh, year or so. Now, ICAO is not acting alone in all of this, and I think another really important aspect is the industry partnership that we have built up. So we work very closely with uh, CANSO, with ACI, with IATA to bring the message to their membership, and they've been very supportive and very active, and also the ICAO regional offices, because uh, Fabio and his colleagues, um, they are on the front line, if I can say that, uh, facing uh, the states and, and the customers in their regions, and they've been very active as well. Now, to back all of that up, um, we've put in place a number of other resources which you are or should be aware of. Uh, we've worked together with um, uh, ACI, IATA, and CANSO to develop training courses 
for the respective um, stakeholders. So there are courses for airport operation stuff that have been developed together with ACI for flight crew and airline operation staff that have been developed with IATA. And then lastly, but not least, uh, for air traffic control staff um, developed together with, with CANSO. And that passes an important message as well. And that's another thing to realize. The, group, the GRF impacts us all. It impacts airports, it impacts ANSPs, and it impacts, of course, the final customer, which is the pilot, the flight crew. And that's another challenge, shall we say, uh, uh, of the GRF and the reason we need to, to get the implementation uh, right. We've also been working together and identified a number of uh, issues where we need to have additional um, uh, clarification, some additional guidance. So we've worked on different areas such as uh, how to use the snow town, which is a new topic for some people, because of course the GRF is now um, applicable in not only in winter conditions, but also in airports that experience uh, rain, non-winter conditions, but they will need to use a snow tam. So there have been some questions around that, so we provided additional clarification. Topics such as the ATIS, which are very important, of course, for, for the air traffic control uh, audience, how they compose the ATIS messages and, and, and such like. Um, other specific topics like how to do the observation on the runway we work with ACI on that, that, that area and we're working on some other areas like uh, how we should um, apply the upgrade and downgrade procedure associated with the GRF. So a really important thing to me is the fact that the GRF is a kind of a team effort when you implement it at an airport. It requires everybody to be involved, it requires the airport operator to be involved. Uh, the air traffic controllers and the flight crew and the airlines that operate into that airport. So it requires very careful and collaborative planning for implementation and perhaps uh, um, resources such as the local runway safety team at an airport might have an important role to play uh, during implementation of, of the GRF. Implementation is underway in different parts of the world now. We have the applicability date on the 4th of November. Um, but in Europe, they have already implemented, also in Canada, uh, maybe one or two other countries that I'm not aware of. Um, to date, we haven't noted any particular issues. We do, or we are aware of some areas where we may be able to make some improvements to the GRF in due course. And we do um, intend to put in place a feedback loop where we, where we will take note of any observations that are made during implementation and bring that back to the ICAO uh, process is concerned and improve the GRF as time goes by. Another really important aspect is the fact that the GRF as it exists today is, is a very human-centric uh, process, so it's based upon human observations by um, airport operations staff, uh, by um, observations by flight crew and such like, so it's very human-based, it doesn't require complicated tools or systems, However, now we have the baseline with the GRF uh, 1.0, if I can say that. Um, industry will provide tools in due course that will help improve the process overall. So we need to be able to take those into consideration as, as time goes by. And I think we need to recognize the importance of uh, the airport operator's role here, going out and, and um, doing the observations. And I think a side effect of the GRF is that we will see more runway inspections and observations uh, um, taking place, which is a good thing for safety, but it may pose particular problems, not problems, but need to be uh, um, accommodated by air traffic control. Air traffic control has a very important role, of course, in communicating the information that comes from those observations um, from the airport to the flight crew, but also quite importantly from the flight crew when they make observations back to the airport. So I think air traffic control has a really important role in, in bringing everything together and making sure that the communications uh, flow. And they also have the big picture. They may be able to see what's happening on the runway that other people don't see. and can give um, advance warning of the need to maybe do another inspection or something like that. So I think that's all I have to say, just to emphasize the importance of this implementation, um, the work that has been done to support the implementation. The fact that we have agreed to this implementation, it's in Annex 14 and all of the other ICAO documentations, 
there are resources there available to, to help people. There are now experiences to help. So there are peers that you can turn to to ask for advice if it's necessary. And we are putting in place a kind of implementation monitoring process that Jamie referred to earlier. So um, we will monitor the implementation, but from the purpose of identifying where we think people might need additional help or support to ensure that we're all ready as best as we can be for the 4th of November, 2021, which is very soon. So shortly thereafter, if not actually on the date itself. So I think that's all I'd have to say, Shane, by way of an introduction from, from my side. So back to you. Thank you, Paul. I, I do have a question for you, so don't don't run off uh, uh, quite yet. Um, if I was someone who needed to find more information about the resources you talked about, where would I go to find those from the IKO side? Um, to the, the GRF IKO GRF website. Um, I don't know what www is, but just Google uh, GRF IKO and it comes up on the top of the list. But then also Fabio referred to the um, uh, the regional um, website as well, which might be also be a good starting point. There are two websites there, the regional one and the global IKO website. I appreciate that, Paul. And I think the biggest takeaway for anyone who uh, uh, is listening to this is there are people in IKEA willing to help, regardless of what stage of implementation you're in, uh, uh, to answer questions, provide resources, or uh, uh, point you in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. We'll talk again later. Uh, smashing job. So we'll move to our next speaker, uh, Pedro Garrett. He's uh, He works in airside operations for Rio Gallio. Uh, Pedro has a background as an airport infrastructure and operations specialist. He worked two years at the National Civil Aviation Agency, ANAC, in the Department of Airport Infrastructure. Since mid-2018, he works at Rio Gallio International Airport and Airside Operations Area, responsible to create the procedures, training, and airside officers, and maintain the operations in compliance with Annex 14 and other regulations. Additionally, he is the focal point for the GRF program in Rio Gallio. So, Pedro, uh, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Shane. It's a great pleasure to be here. I want to say thank you for the opportunity to Fabio for the invite too. And uh, it's not on a great pleasure to be here, but it's an honor to share a little bit about our own experiences on implementation of GRF in Rio Galeon International Airport. As you said, Shane, I work in size operations. So I in charge to develop it, not only the GRF in Rio Galeon International Airport, but the implementation with all the stakeholders. Um, we started to develop the implementation of GRF since the middle of 2019, you know, before the COVID. And uh, we started to uh, work here uh, very hard to analyze the regulation. I like a lot, uh, Paul say that about the past of before the GRF. I like a lot this because before you implement the GRF, you have to understand the why. Why I have to implement the GRF? Why it's so important to uh, side operations? So before to implement, we start to analyze with uh, in a very intense way, you know, to understand the regulation behind the procedure. So we start to analyze a lot of regulation from United States, FAA, and you searching and you find a TALPA procedure, and you, we go to Europe and you find it in those days a snow turn. So we start to see a lot of procedures behind and before the GRF. So these procedures uh, is gonna use to guarantee the safety levels, mainly in raining or snowing conditions. So we start to understand the rationale behind the GRF. After that, you use a lot of the Doc 9981 from IKO and the Annex 14.2 to understand more. And we face it to a huge challenge 
I believe it because we are here in Brazil, we are in a tropical country, you know, so we don't have snow, especially in Rio de Janeiro, we have a specific environment, you know, in Rio Galeão International Airport. We are around by a Guanabara Bay, you know, in some hills too. So we have a specific environment. So you have to understand a lot uh, what periods of the year we have more rainy conditions, what's the time of the day, more important to, to understand a lot the environments are around the airport and how we combine this environment to GRF procedures. So after that, we start to develop the training program. I believe the training program is the core of the GRF. It's like the heart, you know, and uh, you have to use uh, technical and operational procedures to develop this training program, but you have to use to a very practical language, you know, directly from the air side officers. So we start to share this knowledge with air side officers. We divide our training program in two phases. The primary phase is the theoretical phases. You know, we talk about the procedures, the why, the, the past, the procedure, as I said before, you know, to give to air side officers a, a huge vision and a whole vision about the dimension of the procedure and the importance for the Hugo International Airport. After that, the second phase of the training program was the practical phase. And I have to confess is the best phase because we can see the, pro the procedures, you know, in the daily routines, in daily airside routines, you know, and we have almost 50 airside offices. So everyone individually, with training in the, tra in the practical phases. We do a lot of operations in the runway. Uh, and uh, it's very real, you know, we try a lot to become these procedures in the practical phase more real as possible. And uh, in the same time, we're training the ATCO, you know, uh, along the tower. We develop a specific training program. It's more directly, more focused in runway breaking action to give to the controller the knowledge about the procedures. And more important, the knowledge about the fragility which is resided by the pilot. You know, the, the controller have to be able to understand the fragility by the pilot and give the airside officers, if you need it, a specific information about the condition of the pavement on the runway. So as move forward, we are now able to finalize the implementation of GRF by the middle of October next month. We are now uh, phase two uh, develop a short training about the insertion of the runway conditional report in the aeronautical system here in Brazil. So we have uh, to do a uh, very specific and quickly uh, training to air side officers to use this electronic system. And that's it. Um, basically, is there a whole and resume of vision implementation of GRF here in Rio Valley International Airport. Thank you very, very much, Pedro. Um, you, you brought up a really good point about um, each airport has specific challenges that need to be addressed. And so while, while the, the GRF is at a global sense applies everywhere, every location has to have a tailored solution to deal with those uh, uh, specifics, right? Yeah. Yeah. So great. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, very insightful. And we will talk uh, a little bit later. So. Okay. Okay. So for our next speaker, um, Silvia Stănescu from Romatza, which is the Romanian Air Traffic Services Administration. And she also represents IFATCA. She's an ATCO, and currently she is head of ATC Training and Human Resource Management Unit and head of ATCO Training Organization for Romatza. Specifically on GRF, as the head of training in charge with ATC Training, on the GRF material. 
She actively supports colleagues from the ops side with the ongoing GRF implementation program. She's also part of a working group of experts from regulator, ANSP, and aerodrome operators tackling the challenges of GRF coordinated implementation in a region country with white, cold, snowy winters. Um, and I think it's important to point out that uh, in Europe, they have already implemented GRF. However, work continues uh, on the implementation side from the post-implementation activities. And so, Sylvia, uh, she has a lot of information to share on this and a lot of experience. So, Sylvia, uh, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Shane. And uh, saludos desde Romania. Muy bienvenidos a todos. My name is Sylvia. And... Um, Let's say that most of uh, the things I was about to tell you were already said, uh, such as um, what it takes to implement GRF and why it's important to, to implement GRF. Uh, for us in uh, Southeastern Europe, um, we had to implement GRF uh, as of uh, 12th of August. So uh, we started uh, the whole process uh, at the end of 2019, uh, then uh, 2020 came in and uh, we only could resume the implementation at the end of 2020. So um, um, with so many things going on in, uh, in this region and uh, of course around, uh, around Europe and everything, um, we had to adapt to the current situation and um, of course, uh, with the help of uh, all the ICAO documents and the regulation from EASA. EASA is uh, the European Union Aviation Safety Agency. Um, and EASA is uh, the one who decided that for Europe, uh, we'd better implement GRF by the 12th of August. So with that in mind, um, we started um, amending our local current procedures, uh, the procedures regarding the training for ETC. Um, among uh, the things we had to do when implementing GRF, uh, if you zoom in, you have a tower, an airport operator, and of course the technical personnel. And as you zoom out at the general level, at the higher level, you have the NASP from AXA, the Romanian uh, Air Traffic uh, um, Administration uh, Company. Uh, you have uh, the Romanian regulator, uh, the Ministry of Transportation, and of course, uh, the representatives from uh, airports, uh, airport operators, and nonetheless, um, the companies, the, the users of, uh, of the GRS. Uh, so if um, I would address the issues uh, with uh, the implementation of GRF, uh, what comes to mind now is that um, we've encountered some difficulties uh, in the implementation um, in, a, um, let's say, uh, in a continuous form and um, um, the uniformity of the implementation for all the airports was, uh, let's say, one of the issues for us because we have 17 airports. Um, each and every one of them uh, has uh, um, its own budget, its own limitations, its own personnel. And um, um, going from here, uh, trying to, to find solutions to adapt uh, the current situation, the local situation and the requirements, of course, was not easy. As Shane mentioned, um, uh, we have implemented GRF since, uh, since August, meaning that from now on, um, from, from that date on, we uh, starting issuing no, snow temps for each and every airport. Um, but um, the fact is that there are still harmonization problems. And um, EASA continues uh, issuing uh, bulletins uh, safety information bulletins, trying to, um, let's say, grease up uh, the process and trying to, to help us um, to achieve this, uh, to, to fully achieve the implementation. Um, 
I'm speaking as an air traffic controller because uh, I am uh, I am using uh, all the documents and I'm talking as a person in charge with the training of ATC and also as part of this uh, implementation group along with uh, the regulator and the airport administrators. And um, from where I stand, uh, looks uh, good. Things are looking promising, um, but it's something that will need a bit more time to be 100% fulfilled. So if we train our ATCs and our AIS colleagues, and uh, of course, uh, the technical personnel who are in charge with uh, ATIS, um, we cannot do the same thing for the personnel at airports. And this is the biggest issue. Um, as far as I know, um, there is um, there are some GRF, um, let's say, uh, learning modules, uh, specially designed for um, the airport personnel, uh, the airport uh, experts who will uh, assess and will report the runway condition. And it's up to them to provide the training. Uh, for us, the training is completed. Um, we did our best to update the software on uh, our ATIS systems uh, in order to uh, draw information from the published NOTAM, uh, so not to um, put more, uh, more of a load on the shoulders of a controller, because it's easier when you have an ATIS, you don't have to read the, um, the running condition. So, um, so far for us, things are looking good, of course. Uh, we are yet to see a really, really heavy, snowy winter. Um, we are expecting that at the end of uh, October, but uh, so far we are working with snow dumps. Uh, we are working with uh, direct reports. And um, if I can provide any information or any uh, let's say, um, hints on what we did and how to manage the whole process. I'm here for you. Please let me know how can I be of service. Thank you very much, Sylvia. Great presentation. Um, I have I have many questions, but I'll, I'll try to contain it to one. Um, how early, knowing that the that Europe was going to um, Move the applicability, move the implementation date to 12 August. When, what kind of time frame? When did you start working on the training for your ATCO uh, and AIS personnel? Uh, was it six months out? Was it you know longer? Well, it was uh, around uh, March that we started right. uh, producing the documents and uh, training material. And of course, uh, having all the uh, the guidance material and uh, all the all the, the amended regulations, um, we use those as to provide a, a really clean and simple to uh, to understand and to learn material for the controllers and for the AIs. So uh, it took us uh, a few months, but not more than a few months. That's that's excellent, and and I would I would venture a guess that. Um, your organization was one of the first to do this. There were probably some others in, in Europe uh, that did it as well in, in Harmony. But I think my point was you you really were on the forefront of developing this and putting it out there uh, to be ready for this date. And uh, it may be possible that some of that information could be shared in a larger context. So organizations that uh, um, that are trying to get up to implementation fairly quickly can maybe see the kinds of things that you guys did uh, and, and all of the elements. So just putting that out there, not, not expecting an answer, but I'm sure that we could facilitate some type of information sharing to, to, to help move this process along. So thank you, Sylvia. Excellent job. We'll talk here uh, shortly. So thank you. Thank you. So our next speaker, um, Betsabi Isla, she is an AIM specialist from ANAC, Argentina. Um, she's been in the uh, AIM director for the regulation. Uh, she's been an AIM specialist in the director for the regulation of standards and procedures at ANAC. Um, before that, for many years, she worked as an AIS operator and supervisor at the Aziza International Airport and also at the International NOTAM office in Argentina. 
She currently collaborates in the elaboration of the procedures and national regulations concerning the new SNOTUM format. So I'm happy to welcome Bitsabe. You have the floor. Bitsabe, can I hear you? Buenos dias. Muchas Good morning. Gracias. Thank you very much, Shane, for the presentation, for the introduction. Thank you. The subject is the progress in the implementation of the GRF regarding ANSPs. First of all, as country, we participated in the elaboration of the procedures and the particularities are contained in Technical Circular 100.002. In second place, we consulted with the supplier with the ANSPs and all their technical capacity to include the new template in the MHS. Once the Technical Circular 153 was approved, we published three different documents. The first one informed the aeronautic community this technical circular, which has a general description of the GRF, the involved actors, and the different roles of each of them. The second AC published is related to a standardized procedure for the emission of slippery runways when the condition of the runway is wet. And last of all, the last AC that we issued where we inform all the aeronautic community of the starting date of tests, the airports included, and the ACS has a model for the runway, which are going to include the exploiters of the airports to use all the information collected on the conditions of the runway surface. The implementation tests were made in Argentina between August 15 and September 15 in three different representative airports due to their climate like Bariloche, Ushuaia, and Iguazu. In the southern part of our country, we have snowy conditions. That's why the air drum personnel is uh, getting familiar with this snow time form. The implementation of the new um, format was not a big problem. The challenge is in the northern part airports where we have rain showers. Uh, so we had to issue snow tam reports for standing water reports, and that will be a little bit more difficult. We also implemented an open webinar for all the aeronautic community where we presented the GRF from the AIS point of view, we explained how to fill it in and how to read it. The implementation tests that we carried out were useful to detect improvement opportunities in the procedures and in the training that, we, that was offered to the different players. Based on those results today, we are working and organizing the necessary adjustment in the training and in the procedures with the following objectives. Improving training. It is important to strengthen theory and practice, to improve feedback with the attendees, to know which things we can optimize and improve, to improve the um, issuance of snow time from the time the air drone received the um, report on the 
conditions. The uh, personnel of the airport fills in the snow time and then gives a number code for the snow time. All these are challenges that we are facing and where we are working on with the trainers and monitors. Thank you very much. And I give you back the floor to you, Shane. Thank you, Vasabi. And uh, great, great information. I, I have a question. Oh, actually, I have two questions. The first being the time from the runway condition uh, uh, report being or the runway condition codes being established to the time a snowdom is issued. How how many minutes are you seeing that that transition? The validity of the snow town will have an eight hour validity. We can consider that there's no a new issuance on the condition of the runway surface. The snow cam will be valid for eight hours. So if we don't issue new information, we will consider the condition of dry or normal. So, so that actually gets into my second question um, about the standing water. Uh, in some locations, we have extreme rains, uh, water pools, and then it dissipates. And have you experienced this? And if yes, how have you? How have you? How are you dealing with that? We're working on that because the rain condition, Shane, will be in those moments where we have great rainfalls and it is water standing in the rainway. And the changes are very quick. So we will not issue a snow time with the information because the condition with the water on the runway will change very soon. Thank you for that. That's that's one I, I've seen that question uh, uh, specifically about how to how to deal with that uh, over many many different webinars. This is a um, this is a, a recurring question and something I think we will we will uh, uh, explore later on. Thank you, Basavi. Very good, very good. So our, our final speaker is. Uh, uh, Paulo Lopez, uh, she's an AIS specialist in the Argentine air navigation company, IANA, which is the ANSP for Argentina. She worked from uh, 1994 to 2018 as an operator, supervisor, instructor, head of the AI office, head of the AIS office, and head of instruction at the Buenos Aires City Airport. She currently works in the operations management of IANA and is the focal point for the implementation of uh, GRF. So, Paula, you, you have the floor, please. And I still have my audio on, Paula, if you're up. Are you live? Yes. Good day, Shane. Good day to you all. I would like to tell you regarding our experience from the... Uh, ISPN place, the AANA company. I would like to talk about the different stages. The first stage, we receive documents, the regulations, applicable regulations for this implementation, that it is the 153 circular from the aeronautic uh, authority. We had a draft to analyze it. Then, we uh, turn it back with our observations. The Aeronautic Authority asked us through our operational security department, a risk analysis due to the change management that this would cause regarding the template with the same format of the snow TAM. We started working with it since April and we worked with 
specialists with airports that had already experience with working in working with it, plus um, technical people and the supplier of the system MHPS. The tests finalized at the end of the month of August. Regarding procedures that would be that would be carried out with the ATC and AIS personnel to send the information of the RCR, we worked with the regulations and procedures area. The instruction department designed an introductory training focusing on the applicable regulations and the procedures for the ex exception and sending, reception and sending of the information and be sent through the SNOW TEM. We have also designed a more uh, broadened uh, training with practical exercises for the rest of the airports that will be impacted with this implementation. After the test, the implementation tests of ANAC and from the ANSP side reach the following conclusions. Reinforce or strength training for personnel, for ICE operators regarding the use of the snow tam template review the sending and receiving of information of RCR regarding In ATC, we have to strengthen the receival of the reports, the use of technology to incorporate GRFs, and also the different circuits of information or communication for this uh, receiving. Regarding NOF operators, we have to reinforce the receiving of the proposals and the uh, later um, publication of these reports. And last, lastly, and due to the observations, mainly regarding the circuit of the reception of RCR, we have to try to coordinate with the aeronautic authority regarding the applicable regulations on these uh, points that uh, where we found differences and that would be all on my end. Thank you, Paula. Um, excellent. I, I, I'm interested to hear how long um, I know that uh, Yana has been working on this for a bit, but how 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 far in the process are you with getting uh, close to implementation? Have you been, uh, did you start in, in March? Did you start in January? Did you start in July? If you could share that with us, please. Well, we started working, coordinated with the Aeronautic Authority to analyze the regulations and there's no time we started in April, around April. And we've been, we have reached 78% of progress in this path. Excellent, thank you for sharing that. That's excellent. I, I think it's important to establish a, a, a timeline for you know what 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 level of effort are we talking about for uh, organizations so um excellent all of the speakers they did a fantastic job if i could just have you guys uh uh listen in you can turn on your cameras if you want um but i have some questions some that keep coming up quite a bit and i think this group um is is really could provide some good explanation on this. And I've seen this question before. Um, and it's really about what happens with places that don't have ATIS and ATC's responsibility to provide the runway condition report. Uh, um, 
I'll start with Paul because I know Paul, we've talked about this, <laughs> you know, over the course of time, especially in developing ATIS guidance. And I would I would do a plug to the ATIS. Uh, information that's that was uh, developed in partnership with many stakeholders and I think is available on the IKEA website but if uh, so I would if you do have ATIS I would point that direction but let's let's kind of touch on Paul um, those places that don't have ATIS and your perspective on that over yeah uh, if there's no ATIS then of course it falls back on on the uh, the, the, the controller and, and passing the information by RT. And even when you do have ATIS, you may have to pass it by RT because it takes a little bit of time to, to compose the ATIS message and, and get it out. So um, to me, it would be by RT, perhaps as, as a broadcast. I mean, you can just make a broadcast and, and pass the information. Um, or, or you can direct it to a specific aircraft, perhaps on, on, on final approach. But uh, Really, it falls on, on, on the controller to pass it by, by RT. Yeah, and uh, so I'll kind of shift to Sylvia. Um, Sylvia, did you run into that uh, in, in any of your airports in, in Romania that, that do not have an ATIS? Well, for us, out of 17 airports, uh, 10 of them don't have an ATIS. So it's, uh, so it's on, on the controller. It's con the controller's job to, to pass on the information. And um, as far as we've noticed, it, it takes about one minute up to two minutes and even more depending on the runway condition, of course, uh, the time in, in, in which you need to, to, um, to read out that, uh, that message. Ideally, you should broadcast it to the whole traffic, but it's not the case for towers who have an approach above them, you know, uh, when you only have the last five minutes until landing, so that there's uh, not that much time. Um, it's the same issue with, um, let's say, uh, traffic with emergencies that need to land. They uh, they overfly Romania, and for whatever reason, they need to to land as soon as possible. So the ACC or the APP will have to to pass on the information um, on the runway condition for that specific airport. Um, even with the ATIS, the, the, the job is not as easy as it seems because um, the controller would have to insert that information into the ATIS. Uh, we are working in Romania with MicroStep MIS. This is um, the producer for the ATIS system. And uh, as far as I know, they, uh, they adapted as to come, uh, let's say, with an upgrade, with a patch that would allow us to um, more easily insert the uh, um, the runway condition in, in the ATIS. Um, but whenever um, the software doesn't allow that, there is always a, a voice recording that can be added to the ATIS. But uh, that's still uh, up to the controller, or I mean, down to the controller to do that. And um, it takes a bit of time. And of course, it takes a bit of getting used to. And let's not talk about whenever the runway changes because you have to insert the information in the reverse order and you have to pay attention, especially to, to the numbers. A six is different than a three. And uh, if you're a night shift and you are already tired, you know, it's, it's the human factor. So, uh, but our controllers are the best. I'm sure that uh, all around the world, the controllers are the best, so. We, we try to leave as uh, as little room for the mistake as possible. Absolutely. And I see um, Paul raised his hand and, and then I want to go to Paula. Uh, so uh, go ahead, Paul, real quick. You're on mute, buddy. Once or twice, the kind of um, the local conditions and specifics of an airport have been mentioned. And I think in this particular instance, that could be one of those circumstances where Maybe at a smaller and quieter airports, it's it's okay. The controller has the time to pass the information. There's not one airplane every three miles on final approach, and and, and uh, it can be managed. Maybe at some really small airports, the controller is the guy that does the runway inspection. It could even be that. So, and it might work there. Maybe it's bigger airports. Perhaps, you know, this might become 
kind of challenge for the controller. And maybe that's the time to have a discussion with uh, the authorities about, well, maybe we need an ATIS now, maybe we need to, to do that. And I think we talked about this kind of um, embedding kind of time, and maybe during this period, these kind of lessons will be learned and, and these experiences will be gained and uh, the discussion will, will be ongoing, I think. So just a bit of additional thought from my side. Thanks, Paul. And uh, Paul, uh, uh, from Yana's perspective, have you had similar discussions on this uh, uh, with the non ATIS equipped air, uh, airports? Over. Paula Lopez. Sí, hola. Donde no hay. Perdón. Where there's no what? Donde no hay que no no entendí. ATIS. ATIS. For the, ATIS. Donde no hay like latis. Donde no, where there's no, donde no hay latis. Ah, sí. Eh, sí, eh, tenemos, eh, we have muy pocos aeropuertos in very few airports that have digital lattice, but the rest of the airports do not have it. So that information is broadcasted through the frequency and in the rest of the airports, we have the conventional ATIS system. Excellent, thank you. I'm gonna shift gears a little bit. Let's go to Pedro. I have a question specifically Vamos to you. A ir con Pedro. Um, so it says, are aerodrome operator personnel as part of their GRF training encouraged to collaborate with MET personnel to, to get forecast information to assist in advance warning of changes in weather conditions to better prepare? Yeah, uh, absolutely, Shane. In the training program for the side officers, we give it to everyone like a, a huge vision about the environment in the airport, you know. And we started to draw a procedure uh, with the tower, ATC, April, ATC controllers, to think about how we can, you know, measurement the MET area, you know, using the METAR, using some aspect about the, the concentration of the running. So you work together to install a specific screen in central of controller here in Rio Galeão with the raining concentration. So we we'll stack, you know, go into runway, start measurement the water of the pavement on the pavement, you know, combined with this specific concentration of the rain. So the time when rain starts to become more intense, more strongly, we have this information that huge screen and you we get you give this information to our side officers. So they go to the eco, go to a holding point to do the inspector as soon as soon as possible. You know. so, Excellent. Thank yeah, you. Okay. Oh, go ahead, please. Jane, please. If, you, if you, I, I I add some quickly tip, it's very important to when you draw the GRF procedure, we draw with and created this procedure with the tower. It's very necessary to, to think, you know, work in group. That's a good perspective. And that, that collaborative effort uh, uh, needed yeah. has come up several times. Uh, um, mm -hmm. and, and so, yeah, that's mm -hmm. great perspective. Let me, so I just want to tell the uh, participants, uh, by the way, we have over 500 people attending this webinar. So this is fantastic. Um, I think in all the webinars and uh, on-site briefings I've been involved with with GRF, this is far surpassed uh, um, any of those. So congratulations to all of you. Um, let me just talk about the questions. Obviously we have more questions than we can get to in our allotted time, but we will take these questions. Uh, um, Fabio is, does a good job of sharing those with us. And we'll, we'll give answers back because some of them are going to need a little bit of detailed uh, research before providing, you know, specific answers. But there's one that keeps coming up. Uh, uh, but Sabi, I'll, I'll bring you in on this one uh, because we talked about eight hour time frame for a snowdom. And I've seen a couple of questions about um, 
is there is there a requirement to file another snowdom if there has been no change in the runway surface condition over the last eight hours? Um, and I think this is a philosophical discussion. So I'll, I'll ask you, Basabi, to to kind of give your input on this, if you could. Over. I see you're off mute and oh, there you go. Regarding the validity of snow dump, snow dump will always be issued based on the information contained in the RCR. Once the uh, exploiter and the I I as of the air drum are together and the report is issued by the knob that has an eight hour validity. But if there is not a new report of the rainway because the conditions are not such that really needed, we, in eight hours, we will consider that the rainway is normal. But if the operator of the airdrum issues a new new conditions of the rainway, the RCR, because the uh, condition code or the pollutant changed, the airdrum will have to uh, send a new proposal sent to the NOP and take it into consideration for the final issuance of the report. Thank you, Betsabe. Great answer. Gracias, and, uh, Betsabe. And this, this is one that I'm sure we're going to, we'll, we'll see repeatedly. Yes, this... we, have a, we have a lot of questions uh, um, and some of those are redundant. And, as, as a moderator, it's tough to read some of these uh, questions and, and try to um, synthesize it into a couple of statements. So, uh, as I said, we will do this uh, offline. I have a question um, that maybe Sylvia and Paula can answer, and it really does deal with uh, implementation where airport is mixed civil and military. And was it difficult to involve the military? So I'll start out with you, Sylvia. Did you do you have any of those mixed uh, 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 civil military airports? And if you did, can you share some experience with that? Over. Well, for um, us, um, the militaries um, use the infrastructure of the airport, but. Um, let's say other than um, cooperating with them, we don't have anything else in common as ATCs. So uh, we are just sharing the same airport, the same airspace, but they still have their own regulations, their own rules. So I think that Paula will be uh, more suitable to answer this question. Thank you, Paula. Let's see, Paula, anything to add on that uh, about civil military? No? Okay. Um, we may have a communication issue there on, on my side. Oh, I have many things open here, so I'm, I'm hoping that I'm coming through clear. Um, and we are at, oh, okay, thank you. Thank you. We are at, uh, um, 1120 and so i just wanted to ask fabio if he could chime in uh should we wrap things and take the questions that we have and provide them back or um because i know we're a bit over go ahead fabio give me your perspective on that please yes thank you shane i, I think that um due to the time constraint we we can wrap up things now and of course, we will uh, get all the questions, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, from the Q&A section. There are several good questions here uh, that we will take and share with you guys so that we can answer them in a, in a document that will be shared on the, on the event website. So I leave it to you for the closing remarks. <laughs> 
Yes. Yes. No, I would just, uh, that's what I was uh, hoping for is just an opportunity to thank uh, uh, everyone, Paul, Paula, Sylvia, uh, uh, Betsabe, and Pedro. You guys were fantastic. You provided a lot of good information, and I, I really am honored to, to have been able to moderate a panel with you guys. So thank you very much. And thank you, Fabio, for again extending the invitation to do that. And, and with that, um, I'll turn it over to you if you have any last thoughts. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. And, and thank you all to all our panelists um, for, for your support on this. And Shane, please turn the camera again on, please, because I will, I will kindly ask uh, also Marilena for turning her camera on su the support from ACI, Lac and Pedro on behalf of the airports, IFATCA, uh, on behalf of Silvia, thank you for your support. And also thank you to uh, Argentina, uh, from, uh, support from ANAC Argentina and Neana. Thank you very much, Betsabe and Paola, for, for your support. And of course, my colleague, Paul, thank you, my friend, for supporting this event. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad that this is, um, you know, almost over, uh, 500 participants, including panelists. This is a great job. Thank you. And again, uh, Shane, I would like to thank you and please give um, thanks to Javier uh, for the, the support and the coordination uh, on this event. And also, I will leave uh, the final words to, to my colleague Jaime for the closing remarks on this uh, joint CAR and SAM event. Thank you, Jaime. Okay, thank you, Fabio. I think this. Uh... This event was very successful, very good questions, and thank you all for sharing your experiences. I think they will be very useful and states for implementation. And uh, well, uh, just to uh, urge states to follow our implementation plan format and provide us with information so we can continue our assistance in the implementation side. So thank you uh, to all of you and, and, and Fabio and uh, you all for attending this uh, webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you guys, take care. And again, I will leave all the, the recording of this event and the list of questions uh, on, on the website. Again, thank you and stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Everyone.